I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Maybe you'll be tired of hearing me say this, but I'm still anxious. Why, I'd never be tired of hearing you say anything. Thank you. You're welcome. What are you so anxious about today? Well, last week Rusty Riley won the horse race, but instead of getting $1,000 in money, he only got $1,000 in certificates, and I don't think he could pay off Mr. Marlowe with that. Well, maybe we'll find that out today. But what I'm most anxious to find out is about Little Prince Arn. Oh, so am I. Last week, Tillicum, his nurse, caught up with the people who had captured Little Arn, and she got Little Arn back. Yes, but she's still out in the forest, and those bad men are nearby. I wonder if she'll get Little Arn safe. Back. Well, the only way we'll find out is to read. All right. Will you read me the funnies now, please? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well. I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And since you're so anxious to find out what's happened to little Prince Arn, let's turn to the second page of the first section right away quick. And here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Hackett, Breckett, Gray, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> After rescuing little Arn from the outlaws in the middle of the night, Tillicum tells Arn to make a trail in the soft earth leading away from the camp. Next morning, the outlaws discovered Arn was missing and, of course, found the tracks, mounted their horses and rode along the trail away from camp. As soon as they disappeared, Tillicum and little Prince Arn went to the camp and began to help themselves to food and weapons that they'd need for the journey home. Meanwhile, back along the trail that little Arn had left, the horsemen, expecting to find only a little boy, find instead a thing that strikes cold terror in their hearts. It is Voltar, last picture top row, his eyes red with weariness, smoldering rage in his heart, and his great battle axe gripped in his fist, striding toward him. Hey, look, it's Voltar! Turn around and ride for the hills! And then Voltar sees little Arn's cap in the hand of one of them. He roars, Stop! Draws back his arm, first picture, second row, and hurls his mighty axe. Last picture, second row, Tillicum hears Voltar's voice and the shriek, and she looks up to see the horses galloping toward camp. She fits an arrow to her bow, and as the men ride by, empties another saddle. Then, first picture, bottom row, Voltar enters the glade, and then he halts. At the sight of his bride, his anger melts away. Tillicum stands poised between her small charge and her wounded enemy like the goddess Diana. Slowly, almost humbly, Voltar, the hardy son of Neptune, approaches his wood nymph and folds her in his mighty arms. <laughs> Then, last picture, they pack their supplies on the two horses, lift little Arn onto one of them, and little Arn brandishes a sword, thinking himself a mighty hero. And Voltar and Tillicum, leading the horses, turn homeward once again. Oh, wasn't that wonderful when Voltar met those men and gave a big roar, Stop! Yes, they knew they were in trouble then. <laughs> now little Arn is safe so they'll be home again. And maybe next week we'll start a new adventure with Prince Valiant. Now, let's turn the page and see who's there. Very well. Over the page we go. Oh, it's Robin Hood. Yes, Robin Hood. And you remember last week, the sheriff of Nottingham had ordered his men to dress like Robin Hood's merry outlaws and rob the wagon train that was carrying the gold that was to ransom King Richard. But Robin Hood heard about it just in time, and Robin and his men uh, came to the rescue, and they beat off the sheriff's men and stopped the robbery, and they proved to the queen that they were loyal to King Richard. And then they discovered that the Maid Marian had been captured by Prince John, 
and that she must be kept a prisoner back at the castle. Oh, I wonder what Robin Hood will do about that. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. Some music. Hi-ho! Back at Nottingham Castle, Prince John and the Sheriff of Nottingham, who are sure their plan to rob the wagon train of the gold that would buy King Richard's freedom, see their men approaching. The drawbridge is lowered, and the horsemen thunder across into the castle. Third picture, top row. Slowly, four of the horsemen dismount and approach the expectant pair on the landing. With lowered heads, the four men come up the steps and stop before Prince John and the Sheriff. And then, last picture top row, four knives are whipped out, and Prince John and the sheriff look into the faces of Robin Hood and three of his men. Robin says quietly, lead us to Maid Marion or forfeit your lives. As Prince John turns, first picture bottom row, Robin says to two of his men who are guarding the sheriff, guard him till little John and I return with the maid. later, Prince John is unlocking the door of a dungeon. As he swings it open, Robin looks within, third picture bottom row, and exclaims, Marion! Marion rises to her feet and rushes to Robin Hood. Last picture, she throws herself in his arms, tears of joy in her eyes, as Prince John stares on, helpless in the grip of Robin's huge friend, Little John. You did say it, and you were right. And now that the queen knows that Prince John's been doing all those things, I wonder what she'll do. Well, maybe we'll find out next week. Now let's go across the page, past the Lone Ranger, turn over that page, and on page five, under Buzz Sawyer, there's Donald Duckle. Oh, my favorite, favorite, Donald Duckle. Then we'll read your favorite right now. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiggly chicka chat. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Today, Donald is to make a speech at a very important banquet. So we find him all dressed up with his three nephews in his car, barreling merrily down the highway. Well. <laughs> Donald gets out of his car and looks at a flat tire, then at his best suit and exclaims, Oh, Dwarf, I'll look fine at the speaker's table after changing a tire. His nephew Dewey exclaims, Hey, Uncle Donald, I have an idea. There's a first aid kit in the back, and well, you know what you could do is... Good, we'll do it. <laughs> A few minutes later, Donald's nephews are just finishing bandaging both of his hands. Donald says, Dolly, you'll be a genius when you grow up. Last picture, top row. A car comes along the road, and then the driver, seeing Donald standing beside the road with both hands bandaged, suddenly stops. <laughs> Little Huey says, I missed her. We need help. And by the time you can say, get out your jack, Jack. <laughs> the man is changing Donald's tire. Donald stands by, trying to look as helpless as he can, and he says, This is most kind, sir. The man replies, Why, shucks, couldn't turn down a guy in your shape. And then he gives a final tap. Ah, oh, there you are, pal. Good as new. And Donald sighs, Thank you, kind sir. <laughs> A few minutes later, the nice man who changed Donald's tire is driving along the highway. When he hears behind him, he pulls to one side to let the driver behind pass. The car pulls up beside him, and his hat pops off in amazement. For there is Donald, without a bandage on his hands, driving his car. And Donald shouts, Thanks again, buster! The man is so furious, he jerks on his wheel, and... <laughs> The 
last picture, we're at the banquet, and there sits Donald at the speaker's table, his coat tattered and torn, his collar half ripped off, his tie dripping like a wilted leaf, his hair mussed up, a lump on his head, one black eye, and strips of adhesive tape crisscrossed over bruises all over his face. And the Toastmaster gets up and says, <coughs> uh, The next speaker, Donald Duck. Oh, that silly Donald. <laughs> he should have left the bandages on his hands when he drove the car past that nice man. Yes, if he'd been smart, he would have. But I guess he was so grateful he forgot to keep his hands hidden. Either that or he was so smart alecky he thought he'd show the man he'd tricked him. That was his big mistake. Yes, that was his big mistake. Well, now, there's no mistake about this. If you'll turn to the last page of the first section, I'll read Flash Gordon for you. Oh, and I'm anxious to read Flash because he's on the planet Venus and he was captured by King Stang. And King Stang ordered Flash to go with Queen Vicky out into the forest with the harvesters. And King Stang warned Flash to watch out for the blue ones, who are some huge, mysterious creatures, sort of like octopuses. Yes, and as Flash and one of the guards were keeping watch, a long tentacle came out of a tree and caught the guard in a vice-like grip. And when everyone heard the guard yell, everybody ran away, leaving Flash and the queen there alone. Then Flash started to help the queen and suddenly felt himself caught by one of those tentacles. Ooh, I wonder what he'll do to get away. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. A rega rega doon doon saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. Hurrying back to the clearing in response to Queen Vicky's cry for help, Flash suddenly finds himself in the grip of a huge blue tentacle. As he's thrown to the ground, his precious chemi gun slips away and lands just out of reach. Second picture, Vicky sees Flash's predicament, but so great is her panic that she flees screaming to her flying jet car and jams down on the starting pedal with a trembling foot. Last picture, top row. For a few seconds, there was a desperate tug of war. But just as Flash is about to lose the unequal contest with the blue monster, his outstretched fingers manage to grasp the chemi gun. As the fantastic denizen of the jungle drags him closer, Flash fires point blank at its gelatinous body. As an inhuman bubbling cry and the tentacles slowly relax their grip, the blue one is no more. Flash shouts, Vicky, I got him! I got him! But his words are drowned out by the roar of the jet car as it takes off. And then Flash stares horror-stricken as a pair of massive tentacles dart up from the jungle foliage and stop the car in flight. Ooh, I'm glad Flash escaped, but look what happened to the queen because she was selfish. Yes, can you imagine those blue ones being strong enough to stop a jet car? Well, I think the queen was crazy to go into the forest in the first place if there's anything that dangerous there. I think you're right. I wonder how Flash will ever get away from there safely. Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and I know you'll find them on the first page of the second section. And I know you're right, so if you'll pick up the first page of the second section, I'll read Dagwood and Blondie in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. It's the end of the day. Dagwood is coming in the door. Oh, boy, it's good to get home tonight. I'm as hungry as a bear. Dagwood, don't take off your coat and hat. We're going to a recital for Mrs. McNuff's pupils. What? Last picture, top row. Dagwood watches with a watering mouth as Blondie puts a delicious meal in the oven. Your supper's all ready. We'll keep it warm for you in the oven until we return. Oh, this is cruel! And then she whisks him out the door and down the street. First picture, second row, they come to a peanut stand. Dagwood stops, but Blondie pulls him along. She has to give the recital early so it won't keep the children up so late. A few minutes later, they pass a hot dog stand. <laughs> Dagwood reaches for a hot dog. No, Dagwood, you can't have anything to eat now. Last picture, second row, they're at the recital. A little girl begins to play. <clears throat> Dagwood begins. 
begins to think of a 40-decker sandwich filled with cheese and ham and onions and mustard and hamburger and hot dogs and sour pickles instead of sour notes. And then... the, the piece comes to an end. Finally, the time comes, first picture, third row, when Mrs. McNuff announces... <clears throat> uh, the final number will be a violin duet by... Uh, <clears throat> As two little kids play, Dagwood thinks of a big platter of steak and mushrooms and potatoes and fruit and string beans and onions and hot rolls and butter and molasses in January. And then the recital is over. Dagwood's out of his chair and out the door. Hooray, it's over at last! Blondie sticks her head out the door and yells... Dagwood, wait for me! Last picture at the Bumstead house. Dagwood dashes for the oven. Takes out the plates. Blondie, my supper's disappeared! Nothing but empty plates! And then second picture, bottom row, he hears Blondie saying to the maid... I'll phone you when I need you again, Julia. And he hears the maid answer... Oh, I love to do your cleaning, Mrs. Bumstead. You always have such nice things to eat sitting around. And last picture, Dagwood dashes into a diner. The waiter says, uh, What do you have? Dagwood grabs the catsup bottle and starts shaking catsup in his mouth, and he gasps, Anything, just so it's quick. <laughs> <laughs> when he gets hungry, he gets the biggest appetite in the world. Yes, I don't think there ever was an appetite to compare with Dagwood. <laughs> but I think Blondie was mean not to let him have a hot dog at least. I think so, too. Well, now I know you're anxious to find out what Dick is doing now. Oh, yes, I am. So let's turn over the page quickly. Go past page two, turn over page three, and here on page four of the second section is Dick's Adventures. Oh, yes. Because Dick was with Captain Oliver Perry in the early days of America when the Americans were at war with the British. And the important day came when Perry and the British ships were to engage in a furious sea battle. But just then, Dick woke up, and I wonder if he'll fall asleep again and dream about the battle. Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. It's the end of another day, and Dick has gone to bed. He's been reading about young Oliver Perry in the War of 1812. Dick's dad and mother find him asleep with the light still on. As they tuck him in, his dad says, Well, Dick's been dreaming about Perry's battle with the British on Lake Erie in the War of 1812. He's probably back in the old days right now, Mother. In Dick's mind, he goes back, back, back. Last picture top row finds himself fighting beside Captain Perry and his flagship, the Lawrence. All day the battle is raged, and the ship is rapidly being battered to pieces by the British guns. Perry orders Dick to have a small boat lowered over the side. First picture, second row, as the British see Captain Perry and his men row away from the battered ship, a triumphant shout goes up. Hey, Perry is heading here to surrender! But the British don't know Perry. Last picture, second row, in astonishment and rage, they now see that Perry, with unbelievable effrontery, has no intention of surrendering, but is transferring his flag to another ship. A maneuver that few fighting skippers before or since have ever attempted. He is showered with shells. First picture, bottom row, Perry runs up his flag. And it's quite a flag with words by another fighting skipper whom Perry has always idolized. On it are the words, Don't give up the ship! And with this flag flying at the top of the mast, Captain Perry, the skipper who should have surrendered, comes racing back. He roars through the middle of the demoralized British fleet. The British are doomed, and Dick is shouting at the top of his voice, We have met the enemy, and they are ours! We have met the enemy, and they are ours! We have met the enemy! 
last picture, Dick sits up in bed, his fist clenched, and sees he's in his own room in the world of today. And Dick exclaims, Wow, I've been dreaming again. But Perry really said those words, and I'll bet no one will ever forget them. And I know he said those words. We have met the enemy and they are ours because my teacher read it to us in school. Yes, that's right. I read it too. And you know something? I've been taking Dick's adventures to my history class, and we find it very helpful in studying history because we see the pictures just the way it happened, and it helps us to understand just the way things were when we read our history books. That's an excellent idea. You keep on doing that. Now look, underneath Dick's adventures, there's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, and last week Rusty won the horse race, but instead of getting $1,000 in money, he got in some kind of certificates. That's right, gift certificates. Yes. They're pieces of paper that you can give to a merchant, and he'll give you so many dollars worth of goods for them. Yes, but Rusty was going to use the $1,000 to give to Mrs. Jones so she could pay Mr. Milo the money she owed him. That's right, because if she doesn't give Mr. Milo the $1,000 before the day is over, she's going to lose her farm. I wonder what Rusty's going to to do now. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty is very worried. He and Pete and their friend Stovepipe are at the barn at the racetrack thinking the situation over. Rusty's saying, Golly, Mr. Stovepipe, I thought the prize in that race was $1,000 in money. We can't pay off Mrs. Jones's mortgage with purchase certificates. Stovepipe answers, Yes, it is indeed a bitter blow, but I suggest we appeal to this stony-hearted skinflint. First picture, bottom row, they enter Mrs. Jones's house. They find Mr. Marlowe and the sheriff in the parlor with Mrs. Jones. Marlowe snaps... Hey, what's the idea of busting in here? Can't you see we're busy? The sheriff, recognizing Stovepipe, answers, Hey, now, wait a minute. Aren't you a Doc Stovepipe from the carnival? Why, yes, Sheriff, I'm often referred to in that manner. Rusty turns to Mr. Marlowe. Hey, Mr. Marlowe, Mrs. Jones owes you $1,000. W- will you accept this $1,000 and purchase certificates as payment? Huh? What? Certificates? Don't be silly. The sheriff answers, Well, now, that's a reasonable offer, Marlowe. No use being too hard on this lady. Why not take it and be satisfied? Nothing doing, Sheriff. I got a right to demand money, and I won't take nothing else. Just then, the doorbell rings. Mrs. Jones goes to answer it. In a moment, she's back, saying, Why, it's somebody to see Rusty and Pete. I forgot to tell you, he was here before. He says his name is Clem. And Rusty exclaims, Jeepers, that's Clem, the sailor off the freighter. You remember he was the good friend to Rusty and Pete when they had that shipwreck with the horses? That's right. I wish he had a thousand dollars. He would loan it to Rusty. So do I, because that nasty old Mr. Marlowe won't take a thousand dollars worth of gift certificates. I wonder what Rusty will be able to do. Well, maybe Clem will bring good luck. We'll find out next week. Now let's turn over the page. Oh, look, on page six, here's Roy Rogers. Yes, and Roy Rogers is in trouble. He and a man named Brimstone Barlow were going to try to capture a gang of outlaws headed by a man called the Sphinx. Yes, and Brimstone and Roy were on a raft crossing the river to get to an old mission, which was the outlaw's hideout, when all of a sudden, two outlaws on the cliff above the river began shooting at them. Well, let's see how Roy gets out of this. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. hi yip by yo now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip by yo As the outlaws fire away at them, Roy takes out his knife, saying... I'm cutting this ferry loose, Brimstone. Those outlaws mean business. Brimstone shouts, Well, if I hadn't reformed, I'd gun him down and forget my mission to convert bad men, Roy. The outlaws, seeing what's happened, run for the horses. Come on, we'll get them when they float around the bend. Third picture, top row. The raft goes around the bend in the river. Roy mounts trigger on the barge, saying, All right, the coast is clear. I want to capture those bandits and use them as hostages to get inside the Sphinx's hideout. Brimstone answers, Well, we got a better chance just posing as outlaws, Rogers. They ride off the barge. Clamber up onto the bank, and then they wait behind a rock. They hear galloping horses. And a second later, the two outlaws come around the bend, last picture top row. Roy shouts, All right, reach, gents. Okay, Brimstone, get that guns. We'll show them how real gunmen operate. Brimstone answers, Roy... Yeah, you said it, uh, Hogleg Harrison. At 
this moment, first picture bottom row at the outlaw's hideout, which is the old mission. The lookout has been watching what's been going on. He shouts down to the leader, the Sphinx, below. Hey, Gusty and Al have been grabbed by them men who crossed the river. They're headed this way. The Sphinx doesn't say a word, just turns, makes a signal. One of the outlaws grins. <laughs> hey, Sphinx wants us to watch the fun. Gusty's leading the pilgrims toward that piano wire struck between the trees. <laughs> few minutes later, Roy and Brimstone, third picture, bottom row, with the two outlaws ahead of them, approach the outlaw hideout. As they come between the trees, the outlaw named Gusty shouts back to Roy. You can't fool me, you hombres are lawmen. Get horse! The two outlaws trot slow over their horses' necks and break into a swift gallop. Roy shouts, hey, they're making a break for the mission. Brimstone yells, no, don't shoot, Roy. And then last picture, the wire stretched between the trees, catches them at the throat. I, I, what's that? I... And Roy and Brimstone have pulled off their horses. They want in thunder. Oh, that's terrible. That wire could cut their throat. And that's what those outlaws would like to see happen. Galloping like that against the thin wire and then being thrown to the ground, why, they're sure to be knocked subconscious. Yes, they're sure to be knocked unconscious. And then the outlaws could capture them. Well, we'll find out for sure what happens next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man... The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.